We're, hey, it's okay to, do, to make a statement fun in a fun way, which is we're all aboard. We're headed to heaven. We're citizens of heaven. Amen? Amen. This series is This Is Us, meaning everybody, all of you matter, and we all need to do everything together. What Lord asks of one, he asks for all of us. So we all need to be responsive to what God is directing us to do because we're together forever and ever as the family of God. Watch this video, see if we can play it. not a human being on the earth that's trash. Every human being on the earth is precious in God's sight. I don't care where you live. I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care how much money you have or don't have. Every person is precious before God, and it's not God's will that any perish, but all have everlasting life. And He's wanting everyone to be a part of us, the family of God, the forever family, the redeemed people who have received the forgiveness of God. Now today, my message title is Forgiving and Giving. And I teach our fifth graders that the mark of a true Christian, they give and they forgive. Religion can give, but religion doesn't do well forgiving. And the best thing you can give is to for give. You give it. You didn't earn your forgiveness from God. There's nothing you could do. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. God gave His Son that we could have it, and He gave His life. Tomorrow, Pastor Anna and Josh are coming, and they're going to arrive around 4 o'clock, and this is the first time they're setting up house. They didn't live together until they got married. They don't have household. They're going to school. They even staying, you know, wisely to save money with their parents. And Anna's got debt for school and all that, so we're going to bless them. But I need some of you guys that are out of school at 4 o'clock to give me your muscle. So you want to give something, raise your hand. If you can come around or about 4 o'clock, we'll let you know where and help. Let Pastor Zach know. Let Pastor Luke know. Let Pastor, uh, Pastor Jeff know. He won't remember, but tell him anyway. And because uh, and, we need some muscle to help them, and they don't have a lot of stuff. In fact, if you have a sofa or any furniture, let us know. We'll try to connect with them so we can help them get set up for real life here. One thing I want you to know, while I'm talking about forgiving and giving, I'm not talking about just finances. I'm not talking about giving just finances. I'm talking about giving much more than that. And by the way, when it comes to finances, what you give is confidential. Pastors do not have access to look at what you give. It's between you and God. It has to do with your heart and your relationship with God. Just like when you have relationships with people, uh, you know, it has to do with giving, uh, giving uh, toward them. Now, here's the thing that you might understand. The key, the key to everything is giving. Giving is the um, theme of the Bible, in fact. You say, what? I thought Jesus' is theme. No. Giving is the theme. Jesus is the subject. G giving is the action verb. Jesus is the noun. He's what it's about. Here's how we know giving is the theme. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believed in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave His Son. Why? So that by grace, you can be forgiven. Giving and forgiving. If you're sitting here and you know when I say forgive, someone comes to your mind, you're having a trouble forgiving, or you said the words, I'll never forgive them. There's an issue that I'm hoping the Holy Spirit will deal with you. I have been forgiven even after I knew what was right to do and did not do it, and I failed God, He forgave me. The Bible says if we confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a God of love who gave that we can be forgiven 
and he gives his forgiveness and his mercy, the Bible says, is new every morning. And the Bible says to, to him who the measure of mercy they give, the measure of mercy will be returned to them. And secondly, it says to, to him, if you judge harshly, you will also be judged harshly. So when you won't let someone up from their failure, from their mistake, their sin, hurtful as it might have been, God's not going to let you up. In fact, he's so serious about forgiveness, he says, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. So pointless to give if you're not going to give forgiveness. Are you with me? Jesus gave his life. And he died on the cross for our sins. And you have eternal life because you gave your life to Jesus. You see, faith alone saves, but faith that alone, faith that saves rather, is never alone. Faith always has a result, has works of righteousness. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, show me your faith by what you do, the proof of the pudding. So therefore, if you look at Scripture, and one time Pastor Austin broke down the word, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> faith to being trust and obey, which is accurate. So I teach our fifth graders that faith follows Jesus daily. That's what real faith is. It doesn't just believe about who he is, what he did, and everything about God. Faith is an active relationship where you're following Jesus every day. It means that you listen to him, you're attentive to him, you talk to him, you want him in your life. He's a part of you, and it's a real thing, a life-living relationship. Now, there's abundant life. Jesus said this, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and have it what? More abundantly, abundant life. To the measure, there's a direct proportionate uh, uh, principle here that's directly proportionate to the measure of your life you give to Jesus that you have abundant life. If you're fully committed, 100%, you'll have fully abundant life. If you give 50% and you're a half and half, you got one foot over here living for yourself and one foot over here living, living for God, you're split 50-50, the abundance is going to be kind of lukewarm. It's going to be a 50-50%. And let me tell you, there's nothing you need to fear in giving all of your life to Jesus. And I stand with arms high, which means surrender. I surrender willingly, not because someone's got a gun in my back. I stand with arms high and heart abandoned to the one that gave his life for me. I stand surrendered. And your life is made up of your resources and relationships. Did you know many people work all their life to get resources so they can so they can live a, a life and have food and shelter and clothing and help their family. And, and, and so you spend a lot of time getting resource. But it's because of relationships, your relationship with God and each other, that really matter. Because what would it be if you lived alone, made a lot of money, and built castles and had all the food and everything, but you were by yourself? Because you see, the Bible is about relationships. It talks about relationship with each other, everything, the principles are there. Even sin is sin because of how it hurts others. That's why God's against certain things, because He loves people. He's not just making up some random law up there, things He's against to, to, uh, to, to hurt people or to be some dictator. It's because He loves people, and, and out of that relationship— the relationships that we have, he gives us guidelines to do unto others the whole law. Do unto others, you have them do unto you, right? To love God with all your heart, so mind and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. That fulfills all of it. That's God. It has to do with relationship. It's a relational book. And our life, the major part of our life is dealt with resources and relationships. And in that, to have it right involves giving. Okay, and I'm going to talk about three different areas of giving. One— is the giving uh, of, of opening your heart. Two is opening your hand. And three is our relationship with God that opens heaven, opens heaven to us. Now, I would never say that life is made up of money. But I will say this, money makes up life because whatever money you have, you spent part of your life to get it. And when you give money, you're giving a part of your life. When you give it to a person, 
to God, to your family, wherever you're giving a part of your time, 40 hours, 50 hours, whatever you're spending, that's resources and you're giving part of your life. So when you give to God, you're giving part of your life in worship to God. And so how we relate to God and how we relate to others depends on whether we're givers or not. And God gives a giving heart to his people. I can guarantee you that. Zechariah, and we'll get to 1 John three seventeen in a minute, but Zechariah 10 verse 1 says this, and he's talking the, the, the phrase, the latter rain is in the Bible eight times. And this is one of those times he's talking about the latter rain. He's talking about blessing. And while the song says accurately, we don't want blessings, we want you. When you go after God with that kind of heart, the blessings come. See, the blessings come. And I will tell you, the father above is like you as a father or a mother. You want to bless your children. You want to bless your grandchildren. And God Almighty wants to bless you. If you go after God, don't worry about the blessings. You let him change your heart. You let him open your hand. And I'll guarantee you, you go after God with everything, he's going to bless you. And it's not wrong to understand that. The Zechariah 10, 1 says, ask the Lord for rain. And note, rain always represents in the Bible blessing, pouring out the rain, the rain of his spirit. It's, it's not wrong to, to ask God. I say, bless you. Pray God bless my family. Bless my church. And I pray for you, God bless you. Uh, and says in the, that verse goes on and says, in the latter time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain. Look at this, mark it, grass in the field for everyone. Provision, guys, blessing. I pray God give you all of your grass in your field for all of you. I had an uncle one time, my wife had an uncle and an aunt, his uncle Ike and, and Oreen. His front yard was concrete all the way, everything concrete. He couldn't grow grass in that thing, hard as a brick. I'll tell you what, that's not the way you want to live. You want to live with God pouring grass into your life and blessing. And I pray that the Lord would bless every one of you new hopers and those of you watching too, may you know God in such a way that you're blessed. And I want to show you three things in their relationship to resources and our resources and our relationship, three things that affect it, that affect our blessing. And number one is an open heart. There's a scripture, mark it down, 1 John 3, 17, notice this. 1 John, that's the last of the Bible, the New Testament, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation, the end of the New Testament. It says, but whoever has, excuse me, this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You see someone in need, you, you have provision, and you just shut your heart. You're not, there's no way God could speak to your heart. This doesn't mean that every need you see, you fix, because in doing so, we know what it's like to enable a person to be, addi- to be in an addiction, to enable them not to face the reality of life. But I want to taste something. There's a difference between uh, having an open heart and being led by the Spirit, your heart open, to if God were to speak to you that you would give abundantly out to bless and to help anybody that you see. There's a big difference, isn't there? As opposed to having a closed heart, and there's no way you're ever going to ever be generous or give to anyone or any need that you see, you know. And so as the Spirit leads you, as as God puts His will in your heart, that you're willing to respond from the heart. And notice in this verse, whoever has the world's goods, in other words, you have the means, you see a brother, and you shut, uh, he shuts up his heart from him. It's, it's It's an act of your will. It's, it is you have the ability to open your heart and you have the ability to shut your heart. God has given us a free will. And when we see a need, we have the ability to open or shut our heart toward it. And uh, I will ask you a question. When we're talking about shutting our heart and opening our heart, have you ever shut your heart toward a person, toward anybody? Maybe they've hurt you. You just shut your heart. You're done with them. Your heart's closed. Okay? And some of you... Have you ever shut your heart toward God? God wants to come into your heart, change your heart, speak to your heart. You've closed it down. Maybe you're disappointed. Maybe you had an experience that was an experience of sorrow, a tragedy, a struggle, something you didn't understand. I could have easily shut my heart when my dad got cancer and died at an early age. When I saw other people that were so ungodly, lived to be 90-something years old, and I just wondered what in the world is going on. The psalmist had the same struggle. You can read about it there. It says the same thing. But you know, here's the deal. 
and you open your heart toward God, God will come in and he will reveal to you. He will show you things. He will open your eyes. He'll help you see things from his perspective. You see, wisdom is not something we can come up with. We ask God to give it freely. And when God gives wisdom, listen to me carefully and write it down. He helps you see the things the way he sees them and feel about it the way he feels about it. And if you close your heart, you can't see what God sees and you can't feel the way God feels about it. We have a choice to keep our heart open toward God and toward others. So please don't close your heart. You know what the Bible calls closing your heart? Hardening your heart. That's what it calls searing, searing your heart, your conscience. So you, 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 you harden your heart and you close your heart toward God by rejecting His Holy Spirit conviction. And it's like, you, you know, like in an iron, you sear or you sear meat, you burn it, you put a hard shell there, you know, to keep the juices in. And, you know, you can harden your heart to keep God out. And you, you, you sear your conscience. You, you have a hard heart conscience. You can't hear from God. You can't be convicted by God. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and we can do that toward others, too. Shut them out and, and, and have a, a heart that is, uh, uh, that is uh, <clears throat> hardened. And that's not what we want. Look, mark this verse down. If you're taking notes, like Pastor Zach says, note changers are what? No, heart, note takers are what? Let me hear it. World changers. That's right, because you want, you're serious about it, you want to remember it. <clears throat> mark this one down. It says, Proverbs 28, 14, happy is the man who is always reverent. And that word reverent there means submitted. Submitted. Instead of stubborn and willful for themselves, they're submitted. Happy is the man who is always reverent. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. You'll harden your heart. The NLT, the New Living Translation, says it this way. Blessed are those who fear to do wrong, but the stubborn are headed for serious trouble. The stubborn are headed for serious trouble. A closed heart, listen to me, causes stubbornness. Have you ever been stubborn in your life? Come on. Have you ever been stubborn in your life? Now, let me ask an easier question to answer. Do you know anyone else that's ever been stubborn? <laughs> Are they sitting next to you? <clears throat> See, stubbornness is a real problem in the kingdom of God. You know why? Because it's your, you want your way instead of God's way. That's why. Because your way is more important than God's way. I want my way, stubbornness says. There's a verse in the Bible that we quote. It's from Isaiah 53, the great chapter in Isaiah. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. It's gone astray. We've each one turned to our own way. That's what stubborn says. I want my way, not your way, God. Not your will, my will. Not like the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, my will, my way, my way or the highway. And we close our heart to God. We don't want to hear. We're stubborn. And we just keep going our way no matter what happens. God tries to correct us. He tries to speak. He puts roadblocks up. We have trouble, and we don't learn. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. We do not learn because we're stubborn, hard-headed, etc. No matter what happens, we don't want to change. We're just stubborn. 1 Samuel 5.23, mark this one down. 15.23, 1 Samuel. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Now, I don't think any of you involved in witchcraft, I sure hope not, right? But you might have been rebellious at times. I know I have been. It says, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What? Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry? How is stubbornness like idolatry? You know what idolatry is? It means you have an idol in your life. It's more important than God. Something in your life is more important than God. Something in your life is more important than what God wants. Something's more important. What is that? How is stubbornness like idolatry? idolatry? Very simple. You are the idol. Your will is more important than God's will. What you think is more important than what God says. Well, I don't agree with that. Well, the Bible says it. I don't like that. Well, the Bible says it. I don't want to do that. Well, the Bible says it. Your will becomes more important than God's will, and you are the idol. What you desire is more important than what God desires. Now, don't raise your hand to this question, please. But how many of you have had a stubborn child? (laughs) 
Now, I had, I had one stubborn child, and I'm not going to tell you who, which one, but she would always— <laughs> She, she, she was strong. And listen, I caused part of it. I didn't. You know, we try to clean up stubborn by calling it strong-willed. <laughs> and, and, you know, when she was a little girl, I, 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 I ruined her, man, because I, I wanted kids. It was 15 and a half years when she was born. We'd been married and it's quite a while. And I, I just like crazy about her. And I, I, I adored her. I sang to her every day. And and uh, what, what is this? Do you, is this, is there whiskey in that? <laughs> he thinks I'm too loose up here, so I don't know. Yeah, it's humorous, it wasn't serious. That's water, that's good. Um, and, and I mean, I'm telling you, she got to where I spoiled her so much, I gave her anything she wanted. Mom would say no, behind her back I'd say yes. She knew who to come to. And some of you do the same thing. You're ruining your kids, and I about ruined her. And she got in first grade, and she was defiant. Now, I believe when you person is defiant, when you spank, and you got to do it right. And you're not trying to physically hurt them. You have to put them over your lap so you don't mess up their back, and you use the part made for it like that. And it hurts their feelings and their, and their tail just a little bit, okay? So, but, but, but most of the time, you don't want to—that's not the way to punish. It's only when they're absolutely defiant. I say, do this. You say, no. I say, I'm not telling you. Do no, you can't make me. I say, I'm going to spank you. I'm going to tell the school. <laughs> I say, tell the school. I'm going to tell them they're, they're going to take me away from you. I said, and, and you're going to, exactly, exactly, I said. I said, and then you won't get to live with me, will you? And I won't, you won't get my candy anymore, right? You won't get, so we had this argument going on. So finally, <clears throat> I got tired of it. So I, I decided every day I'm going to make her life miserable. When she walk in from the school, I'd say, go upstairs, clean your room. Do this, do that. I was a general, man. I was barking around. And she would try to argue with me. And so then about the time she did, I just said, come here. I put her in. I just, I'd scold her really good. Pa, 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 spank her. She wouldn't cry. She wouldn't flinch. She didn't check like it didn't hurt her. It didn't bother her one bit. The most stubborn person I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> about, finally, about the 10th day of this, every day for 10 days. Finally, she said, Daddy, why are you being so mean to me? And I said, uh, I love you, honey. And I said, I love you too much to think that life centers around you and that everything is about you and anything you want and that you're, you're the boss and I'm not. Because guess what? God is the final authority over me and over you. And if you don't respect my authority and you undermine that authority, you'll undermine God. Because guess what? The answer of no on earth, the final no answer is police and jail. And in eternity, the final no that God says you're stubborn is not heaven. It rhymes with jail. And God sends nobody there. We choose to go there by rejecting the greatest gift ever given God's own Son. Don't ever say God's mean. He has gave His Son so to get you out of the penalty of your sin, to free you, to give you to heaven. But some of us are so stubborn. We're like my daughter. She, know, she doesn't want I said, look, I love you too much to let you continue down this path. And that's the way God is. He loves us too much to let us go down that path. So He's going to set on you, bear pressure every day. He's going to push on you out of His love to get you to give up. You see, one of the things you give is your life, your heart. Open your heart. Give up. Give it to God. Give up. Quit fighting it. Quit being stubborn. You just want to, you, you know, you're afraid maybe, and you, you believe in God a little bit over here, but you won't give your heart. You won't open your heart. Jesus will change your heart. He'll come in, and He'll forgive you. He'll help you see things through His eyes. He'll help you feel what He feels. He will empower you with His strength. And, 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 and you know, that's exactly what God wants to do. You know, I was, I'm, I'm the boss. I'm the daddy. I told her, Mom and I, we made you, we own you, and you're going to obey us, point blank. And I said, God, the Bible says God is the, is the, is the, He is the shepherd. God is, the, we are His people, and He made us. He created us, and He is our God. We are the sheep of His pasture, and He is our God. So you better know that. The worst thing you can do is undermine any authority, parents. Listen to me. Not a teacher, not an officer. Not any other authority, and not a pastor, not a school teacher, anything. You undermine authority, and you're sending your kid into rebellion. Don't ever do it. Big mistake. Please don't shut your heart. 
Don't shut it to others. Don't shut it to God. Could God be saying to you, and I am God and you're my creation, you're my child, and I'm going to bear on you every day till you finally give up and let me take control? Could he be saying that to you? Don't shut your heart. Joy will come in when you give up and have his way. You know, our culture is more about our, our rights than responsibilities. Our privileges as opposed to our duties. We need to surrender to Jesus and his will. We want our liberties instead of walking in love. We want to do everything we can and still be okay with God because we're more about this earth and this life than we are eternal life. Jesus wants your whole heart. Open your heart to God. The second thing you open is your hand. Notice Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8. Is there any among you a poor man or your, of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you? You shall not harden, look at that, don't harden your heart, nor watch, shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and look willingly, an act of your volition, your will, willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. So this is an act of your will. You can shut your heart and you can shut your hand or you can open your heart and open your hand. And here's the thing, here's what this is talking about. Look, look, see here, watch this. It's mine. It's my life. It's my will. My money. My talent. Mine, mine, mine. And this has to do with opening your hand control. Oh, I'll give to you as long as you do what I say. There's conditions. As long as, Pastor, you don't offend me in what you say, I'll give to the church. You hold this right here. Let me tell you something. Uh, many, many people in our family are people that they keep their hands closed. They go, it's, my, it's, it's his way or the highway, it's her way or the highway. And at work, it's the same way. And we're not changing it. I don't care what you say. This is the way it's going to be. And they're stubborn. They're hard-headed. They're willful. They're prideful. And, and, and they won't give in to anything. Let me tell you one of the blessings of this church. is, And this is a failure in America is that we don't trust God and His will and His operations through, through, through each other. We don't trust each other. And a lot of leaders lead like this. They come in and say, this is God's will. They come and do a dicky meeting and they say, God spoke to me, we're going to do this. And someone tries to talk some sense into them and they won't listen because they've got this. this is, they're, they're stubborn. They're going to do this thing. Their hand's not open. And it's, you know, it's my will. It's what I want. And I'm going to control this because I'm fearful and I'm prideful. Those are the two reasons. I'm fearful that if I release control, what will happen? I'm proud and think that I know better than anybody else, so we got to do it this way. Fearful and prideful. Let me say that again so I can offend everyone equally today. <laughs> we control things so because we're fearful, we're rebellious and selfish and fearful and prideful. Fearful that if, it, that if I don't control it, so, something will go wrong, and pride that, that I know what I'm doing and nobody else does, and it's going to be my way or the highway. It's wrong. You see it in families, you see it at work, you see it in business, you see it in relationships. And a lot of people, there's strings attached to every kind thing they do, everything they give, and if they don't like something, they're going to pull back and they're not going to do it because they're the center of their universe and they're stubborn and selfish and fearful and prideful. You know why it's wrong? Because it's a whole lot better when God's in control. We open our hand and say, God, I believe this is your will. Hey, let's talk about this. What do y'all think of this? and trust God in the process and His will and His Spirit to be within us. You know, Paul cares enough about unity that he mentions it, and God privately met with Apostle Paul and, 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 and spoke to him. In every one of his letters, all 13 Pauline epistles, he wrote, and he says, contend for the unity of faith, be of one mind. That's why we're talking about this is us. Because guess what? I talked about worship. All of us should worship. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Everybody needs to come in and engage and bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that's within me and bless His holy name and worship Him in spirit and truth. Bless the Lord and praise God. Come in with a song. Everybody sing. Everybody be a prayer warrior. And he talked about witness. Everybody's a witness. It's not just one. Everybody use their gifts. Everybody serve or work. There's one thing to use my gift. I can sing, but I also can work. We can work. We can do dishes after our fellowship. We can cook meals. There's, we can work. See, it's us. 
It's what we are. It's what the body of Christ everywhere should be. It's who Jesus wants us to be. Worshippers, witnessers, and we also need to be givers and forgivers. That's who we should be. That's who marks us as the believers, as the hands of God. So, so what's wrong with this closed hand approach is, it's, is that we're in control, but we want God to be in control, and that's why we need to let go. You know, Susan, lot of, we have this discussion, I don't know about you, we have this discussion a lot, and she says, I said, what are we going to have for supper? She says, I don't know. I said, why don't we just go out? I, you, don't have to, you don't have to cook. She's not a very good cook. And um, I said, that's, she can when she wants to. She just doesn't want to. Um, she makes some mighty mean meals, so. She knows that I'm, I do this to her, but I don't pay her. But now, I had to get permission for Taylor, and it used to be $5. I think it's about 50 now per time. So when I use her in the illustration. But it's, this is true. This is, this, is, this is actually, I asked her last night, is this true? Is this, does this happen? Because am I just remembering wrong? Because I am old. She said, no, that's what happens. I say, well, honey, I'll go anywhere you want to go. Where do you want to go? It doesn't matter to me. Just where do you want to go? She thinks about it. She says, oh, you, you know. Well, what do you want to do? I said, no, no, no. Anywhere you want to go, I'll go. She says, let's go to Chinese. I go, eh. uh, Chinese, you know, Chinese is not my favorite thing. I, um, but, but I mean, any, 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 anywhere you want to go, just you name it. Well, let's, let's, go, to, let's go to a Gabi girl. Let's go get some Mexican food. I said, well, you know, I like that, but you know, my stomach, that's spicy. I, I don't, I don't think. She says, oh, okay, well, well, I tell you what, let's just go get a sandwich, so a sandwich. Bread. I said, Oh, why would we want to buy that? We can make a sandwich at home. Just <laughs> and, and then we want, to, we, want, we want to say, your will be done, but really, we don't. We're like that. Have you ever experienced that? It's like, I want God's will to be done, but then I say no when God tries to tell me because my hand is closed and I'm in control. I don't want to hear what you got to say, God. And so we can all be selfish and proud and rebellious and fearful. Keep an open heart, keep an open hand, which means giving up, giving up. Giving over, giving over your will, giving up your heart, opening your heart, giving out, just giving. And the third thing we open is heaven. In Malachi 3, you go, you, now, you, now you know. How many know? Raise your hand, you know. Malachi 3, raise your hand. Hi. When I say Malachi 3, you know. Raise your hand. Like the rest of you, I wish you'd read your Bible. Okay, Malachi 3, verse 8 to 10, says this. Will a mere mortal rob God? Notice he calls us mere mortals. You're a human, I'm God, okay? I'm the dad, Taylor, you're the daughter. You didn't make me, mom and I made you. I'm in charge here. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, well, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Let me just say this, God doesn't have a bucket of curses up there that he's waiting to pour down on you, yes, baloney, and God doesn't place the curse on you. We are cursed by sin, and we're under a system on earth that's cursed. And if we want to be in relationship with God, we need to honor Him first. And then He's actually up there with a bowl of blessing waiting to pour out upon us, to open heaven with a bowl of blessing. He's not sitting there going, I'm going to curse you. That's crazy theology, and it's not found throughout Scripture. He says, he says, you're under a curse, your whole nation. Notice your whole nation because you're robbing me. And he says, bring the whole tithe. Look what it says, whole tithe. What does whole mean? In the Greek, it means whole. In the Hebrew, it means whole. And in English, it means whole. All of it. The whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Test me or try me and see this as the Lord of God and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. See the word open in heaven? He'll open heaven, the floodgates of heaven, and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. See, we don't pursue blessing. We pursue relationship and a right relationship with God. The whole tithe, the tithe is 10%, okay? One dollar out of 10. There are a lot of people who don't give their whole tithe. God doesn't put us under a curse. Like I said, we put ourselves there. We're not under that window of blessing. And you know, I would never make fun of a person in their faith journey. Hear that clearly. I'm not making fun of anyone, and I don't remember who or when exactly. It's been a long time ago. But I can remember someone once saying to me, and I think it's a common thing that people might say, hey, Pastor, I'm up to 6% of my tithe. I'm up to paying 6% of the tithe. I'm going, that's like saying I'm, I'm paying 6%, 10%. Tithe means 10 10 percent. And, 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 and the windows will not open until we are obedient and pay the whole tithe, the whole tithe, to the storehouse. 
not goodwill, not, not a missionary, not an evangelist, you know, not um, uh, Red Cross or wherever else or any other ministry or to a friend or even a missionary. Those are offerings. Those are gifts. Those are generosity from your heart. Someone says, well, I pay my, I, I pay my tithe by giving to my neighbor or I, I, I give a ride to church or by paying for a visitor's lunch. Is that the storehouse? Absolutely not. Those are offerings. Those are kindness. Those are giving. I buy people stuff all the time. It's not even close to my tithe, and I know that deep in my heart. The storehouse, which is clearly in Scripture, the house of God. And why do you pay your tithe? You give offerings, you pay your tithe, because the tithe can't be designated. Well, I want my tithe to go to this. No, you can't do that because you're in control. It says, I'm going to give, but I'm going to control what I give to. Hey, I want my tithe to go to Pastor Luke because he's the most handsome pastor. Pastor Luke, do you say amen to that? Or I want my tithe to go, to go to this department because that's where my kid is. Well, guess what? We all give and the monies go out and the people responsible for them are responsible before God. And we do our best. And uh, so, so, you know, when, when, when we spend church money, I think of the widow that's on a thousand dollar a month uh, uh, Social Security. And I think of her hundred dollars that she gives and sacrifices to give and live. I think of that. And I try to think of that. And by the way, here's something to think about while you're talking about how you treat people. Why don't you treat everybody like they're suicidal? Quit being mean. I'm sick of mean Christians, judgmental and harsh. And you hide behind Facebook when you do it. You're mean. Quit it. Stop. There's no relationship. There's no place for meanness. Kindness is the fruit of the Spirit, not meanness. Love. Are you with me? You don't know who behind the smiles thinking about killing themselves. I do. I deal with it. So grow up and be nice. And I, who am I yelling at? <laughs> I must be yelling at myself. Usually when I get to yelling, it's at me. I don't know. But you know, you say, well, I can't afford to tithe. Then downsize. Change your lifestyle. <laughs> right? God will bless you for it. It's a matter of devotion and worship and obedience. And if you don't want to tithe, it's a matter of the heart. Some people, they tithe, and they tithe out of religiosity to the penny. And they say, well, the law, you know, the law, it's the law. I don't have to do that. Well, it's just, it was what the law was before there was grace. So how much more should we do under grace? Because the law said don't commit adultery, and Jesus said don't lust. The law says don't murder, and Jesus said don't hate. Right? The law says tithe, as Jesus says, that where your heart is, your treasure will be. And when you tithe, it has to come from the heart because legally you're not any better than anybody else just because you go, oh, let me figure it out to the penny. To the penny. My tithe is $84.21 and a half cents. Ridiculous. That's, you know, like I give out of the heart everything you give, tithes and offerings, and be led by the Spirit. What's behind the history of Malachi 3? Let's go to Malachi 1, and I'm about done. Malachi 1, 8 says, And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Here's the sacrifice as you offer a blind animal. And when you offer the lame or the sick animal, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord. Oh, in other words, give, try that with the government. Say, hey, government, I know I'm a 15% tax break, but here, I'm just going to give you 6%. See how that's working out for you. Not too good, I don't think. Verse 10, Who is there even among you would shut the doors? He's talking about the doors of blessing. He said the whole nation is cursed with the curse because of the disobedience. Let me tell you something. Don't shut the doors of heaven. Be obedient. Verse 13 of Malachi 1. You also say, oh, what a weariness. You know what that's saying? Here he goes again. Oh, I mean, some of you, oh, he's going to talk about money. Oh, uh, you, can you believe? No. If you have the right heart, you're going, yeah, because we know money is life. It represents our time, our resources, our life. We work. We're giving back part of our life. And you sneer at it, it says. You know, and so, uh, and, and, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick for an offering. And should I accept this from your hands, says the Lord, but cursed be the deceiver. The NLT says the cheat. Cursed be the cheat who has in his flock a male. The NLT says a fine ram, a nice animal to offer, and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. He's saying, I told you to give your best because I gave my best. I told you to give your best because I gave my best. I gave my son. Are you kidding me? 
Jesus said, offer to Caesar what is Caesar and what to God is God's. In other words, both of them are important. And I want to say, God is saying, I'm serious about you honoring me with your first fruits, with tithes as my Holy, and as my Holy Spirit leads you with offerings. Jack Hayford, who's a great pastor, I went to four weeks of pastoral training with him out in California. He built a huge church. He's written hundreds of books. He's an amazing man. One of the godly people I've ever been around, anointed by the power of the Spirit. He's 83 years old. He speaks around the nation. He's one of the most highly sought, off, sought after speakers still to this day. He's, he's, uh, he's a, uh, uh, what's the domination he's with? Uh, Four square, four square ch- pastor. He's amazing. He tells a story that when he was six years old, listen to me, that his dad set him down and he put a dime. He said, you know what a dime is? I said, well, let me show you. He put a nickel down in five pennies. He says, that's a nickel and five pennies. He said, a dime. There's 10 pennies in a dime. He said, and the Bible says to pay a tithe. That's 10%. He said, if you got 10 pennies, how much is 10% of 10 pennies? And as a six-year-old, he understood and he was taught it's one penny. One penny out of every dime. So his dad gave him an allowance of a dime, and he paid his penny every week. And he said, all my life, not once have I not paid the full tithe, the whole tithe to God. All my life. He's 83 years old. All my life. He said, but one time when we were young, married, before I was in the ministry, my wife and I both worked, and we both got bonuses at the end of the year. And he said, up until that point, we had never paid a tithe that was three digits, $100 or more. And he said... I thought about that, and he, he said, I started reasoning in my mind. Now, wait a minute. Uh, I worked for the wage, but this is a bonus. Do I really need to pay a tithe on the bonus? And he tried to think this out because of it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, it's still just one penny out of every dime. I had the same thing happen to me in December. I inherited some money. And I reasoned myself, well, I think this money might have already been tithed on. <laughs> I called someone even, had a discussion. Do you think that I should tithe on this? I forget who it was. Was it you, Pastor Jeff? Oh, well, that was somebody. And I was thinking about it because, you know, it was a pretty good size check to tithe. <clears throat> And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it doesn't matter when they had the money they tithed, it came to you, you tithe on it. So I quickly, because I was responsive to the touch of the call of the voice of God, I quickly I wrote that tithe check. And um, so it, it's, it's, it's normal, it's normal. But one more thing before we go here is I give you this verse, Matthew 5. And it's one of the most important ways, I've already mentioned it, to give is to forgive. Say for. Say it aloud. For, for. Give. give. Forgive. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. They don't earn it. They don't deserve it. It's not about what with them are deserving it or, or mandate. You, that's what God says. And look at this is in Sermon on the Mount, right after Jesus said, if you hate, it's like murder in your heart. And you call someone a fool, it's damnation upon you. Your attitude toward others is so important. And then he finishes with this, and look how important forgiving is before you give. He says in Matthew 5, 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, there's a conflict, there's unforgiveness, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So you can faith, you, I don't believe, you know, um, you, can, you can give faithful. And you can give sacrificial, but if you don't forgive, if you have a stubborn pride, your offerings and your tithes will not open up the windows of heaven. There will be no blessing. God is not pleased. He says he won't even forgive you. If you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. So we need to be forgivers. Jesus said, pray for your enemies and bless those who curse you. See, listen, God wants to bless you. It doesn't mean everything's always going to be roses, though. In this world, there's going to be tribulation and trouble, but God loves us anyway, and he is not up there passing on curses to you. See, so with that in mind, as the musicians come, at, at, I ask you this question. Have you hardened your heart against God or against the person? Is your heart hardened? Are you bitter? Are you selfish? Are you stubborn or proud? So that you can't understand the fact that Jesus forgave you, and all he asks is to extend that same forgiveness to others. Some of you need to give up and give your life totally to Jesus. Open your heart to him completely. You've been stubborn. Your heart's been closed. The philosophy of the world rules you and not God's word. You need to open your heart today. You need to
to, you need maybe to forgive. Perhaps you, you need forgiveness. Jesus said, like I said, mercy as you give it will come to you. You will not be forgiven unless you forgive. So open your heart today and forgive. Open your heart and receive Jesus' forgiveness. Let Jesus come in. And secondly, open your hand. Trust God. Try, quit trying to control everything and everybody. You need to open your hands and let go of your stubborn, have it my way attitude. You need to open to God's will and his way. And third, some of you need to open the windows of heaven and get under the blessing of God. You need to start being faithful and systematic in bringing the whole tithe to the storehouse. Perhaps you need to set up online because you're serious and to do a check transfer because you travel, you're gone here, you get behind, you can make a, a check, uh, uh, you can go right online and, and bring right out of your checking account, right in the church checking account, it only costs 25 cents. And then, and I know members of my family that do that. They do that every month. They give the tithe, they give the missions, and then when there's special offerings, they give. In fact, I got a text from my daughter that we had took an offering for something Royal Family Camp. And she says, hey, our website's a little cumbersome in giving online. Maybe we could use a giving app. It's easier. It's not because she was wanting to see it. You know, you young people, you don't carry any money. I mean, you know, why do you need to? Your parents and grandparents buy you everything. You, you don't carry checks anymore. You, don't, you know, you don't have, and there's a spontaneous offering. You don't have any money on you. So if you want to give, you can get serious about it. There's a way to do it. You know, and can I just say one more time, some of you are already obedient in the tithe, but you might need to check your heart to make sure you're giving from the heart of worship to God and honor of God. And perhaps you need to be more willing by the Spirit leads you to give offerings.